We're here uh, in the setting of looking at high-performance teams. Strange. At the Royal Institution, high-performance teams, like, <clears throat> isn't something about business or corporate culture or even just so sociology and society something that we wouldn't actually be at an environment that had mostly dedicated to sciences and the advancement of learning? But when you think about it, there's something new going on in the world, and it's actually very appropriate that we're here. Society's been trying to optimize features of itself for th hundreds, thousands of years, but really we can probably date it um, after, the an after the period of antiquity at the Enlightenment, when there was this idea of secularism, of progress, and empirical evidence with which to understand the world and improve the world. And we did that in the sciences, in the hard sciences, because we could we could measure it, right? We could measure planetary, we could measure the heavens and therefore we could come up with a theory of planetary motion. We could measure small things through a microscope and we could understand biology and we created new disciplines like chemistry. There is a new kid on the block. There is something new going on and it's the reason why we're here today. Data. We can measure new things that we never could do before. And by doing so, we can see things that we could never see before. We can literally detect things that in the past just seem to be part of the randomness of life in the way that sailors used to have maps of the physical geography. And it took a mind shift to realize that actually if we, take the, if we tabulate old log books, we can identify the geography of the sea, not in terms of the physical geography, but in terms of traits that you'd expect, a certain westerly wind in this part of the ocean at this part of the year. And we didn't know that before until we actually, then in the 19th century, applied data to understand nautical maps in a different way. Likewise, we now have a new map of lots of domains, but in this instance, of individuals and teams and people and how they work together and how they can work even better when we measure the right thing, we optimize it, and we learn something new that we can then apply. The good news is that we have a panel today that is very well suited to talking about these issues. Let me talk, introduce who they are one by one. So next to me is Captain Dan Stembridge, He's the commanding officer of the Royal Naval Air Station in Coltrose. Next to him in the middle is Anna Watkins. Anna is an Olympic gold medalist in rowing, double skulls. Uh, that's two people in the, in the boat. Uh, in London 2012, I hear a small snicker. I googled that because my rowing prowess was not as good as my data prowess. Okay, I, I, clearly the audience is more aware of this. Andrew Bailey is sitting next to Anna, and Andrew is the global head of process engineering at Schroeder's. Uh, and formerly worked in Formula One, boat building, lots of other interesting areas in which he applied data and not. Uh, and following uh, Andrew is Merrick Reichman, and Merrick is the Executive Vice President and Chief Creative Officer at Aston Martin. Okay, let's get started. What is the key to high performance teams? Dan, go. People. People. Anna. Interactions. Okay, Merrick. Communication. Okay. People well organized. People, communications, and interactions. Okay, why communications? Well, if you, don't, if you don't talk, you're never going to find anything out. If you don't tell what you're doing, if you don't respond to someone else's question, you're never going to know what you're doing. A well-organized team has to communicate. It's not necessarily talking. It may be through email. It may be through uh, having a process. But you have to communicate what you're doing at any given point in time in that process. Andrew, sound right to you. Yeah, I think um, there's an old adage in Formula One, which was the, the team that employs the cleverest people will win. I think that's been disproven in recent years um, by a number of teams where you've seen that the, the people who have won the championships have always been the world's best organised, and using data as well to fundamentally drive their organisational decisions from how they hire people using psychometrics through to you know, what makes the car go faster. But they're, they're applying not just data to car performance, but to all their manufacturing techniques as well. Before we get to the stuff, let me ask about data to hiring people uh, and stay with you. How would you use psychometrics in terms of knowing who, who to hire? Well, I think, I think as humans, we instantly go for people who look and feel like us, which may be not what we need, I mean, what we want, but not what we need. So um, I'm a great believer, and I've practiced it for many years, of using psychometrics to guide hiring, because you're looking at team fit. I think also psychometrics and hiring allow you to have a proper conversation with someone and say, you know, from your psychometrics, it appears that you've got these traits. 
And then also, I've taken the approach of sharing my psychometrics with people who work in my team, so then we can work out how, how the bond works. So I think the more, more data you can gather to inform you as a human, the better decisions that you'll make. Dan, the military is a place where psychometrics, really? <laughs> well, we do. Um, but coming from a service where we used to hit people over the head uh, and drag them off uh, to join the Navy... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, um, the good old days. Probably not the best place to, uh, to discuss. But it, actually, even, even to use that, um, that point, they only bash people over the head who were qualified, who were trained, who were, uh, who were already sailors. Uh, so even then, they were doing uh, data analysis about how somebody carried themselves, what they looked like in a pub. That's why your mum tells you to take your elbows off the table because sailors used to eat on the table to stop the plates moving around on the ship. So that is why your mother tells you, keep your elbows off the table. So, but as a service, we're a very technical service, very engineering-based service, uh, and we use a lot of uh, data uh, and testing uh, and aptitude testing, um, both practical and written, um, to, to, to choose our people. And before I get to you, I, um, I can mention that the idea of psychometric testing to identify, for example, if two people from two different backgrounds would work well together. Sounds kind of weird that you would do it. Turns out that one of the pioneers of it, as you may know, is NASA. And the reason why, if you're going to put, you know, people, very type A personality men into a space capsule for a week at a time in close quarters under huge stress, pers their personalities have to jive. And we... And the reason why NASA cottoned on to this as late as early as the 60s is because there was an instance of a fight by two Russian uh, uh, spacemen, cosmonauts, in which one stabbed another with a, pen, with a, I guess, an instrument, and the person was bleeding in space, and of course it was almost a catastrophe. So they were very careful that they had the people working well together. Um, so data for psychometrics has been around for a while. It is established. I can imagine that in, a, um, in the intensity of a competition with one other teammate, that psychometrics might actually matter a lot. Um, psychometric testing does, does happen in rowing, does happen in sports, but generally your, your hiring criteria is it's kind of VO2 max and the, whether your, arms are, your arm span is longer than your height and things like that, so you can't exactly um, choose your partner based on what they'd uh, be like. However, it is, as in everything else, a major factor in whether that team is going to, in, is going to succeed a lot. My own partner in, in London, Catherine Granger, she's, she's very different to me. So I'm, I'm a mathematician by background. So when I got into rowing, I wanted to analyse the sport to death, analyse the physics of the boat to death. And it, it really, it wasn't everything. Um, Catherine took a, a very different approach. And what was key for us is to understand and value the other, other contribution. And I think this is, this is relevant outside of sport because you can't, you know, you, you can hire people, you can, you can design teams, you can do all these things, but once you've got there, some of those aspects you can't control, you've got to make that thing run efficiently. Whatever you're landed with, whatever system or process you're stuck with, how do you then make that really work? And, I think there's, you know, there's an emotional intelligence part of that, but there's also, I think, some really fun, fun things along the, along the lines of, of psychometric testing that can help you not just be the best individual you can be in that team, but how do you make the other people in that team be their best versions of themselves? So you didn't choose Kathleen, be uh, Kathleen because, out of, based on any testing, you used your gut, you used instinct. It had to feel right. And she was the fastest for <laughs> <laughs> So I rest my case. Data was the most important thing that you used. Okay. So you used data. Okay. So she was the fastest. But however, however, um, you had won a bronze earlier with another uh, teammate, and she had won a silver at another Olympics uh, in a, in a four-person boat. So you came together, and it, you didn't sort of like third place and second place didn't come to 2.5. It came to first. So something magical happened. Yeah, and I think that that is um, what I alluded to in the, in the interactions between the two halves. So when Catherine races, she approaches that race like the only thing that matters is being in the moment, red miss, I can't wait to be in the fight, it's all about passion and intensity and excitement and let's just go. And you, anybody that you watched her race or see her race, you can see it in her face. And 
This produces a racing style that is first to 500, first to 1K, first to 1500, and then some kind of nuclear explosion in the, in the last 500 meters, which is what happened to her in, in the Beijing Olympics. Me, I approach racing because I'm a geek and I get really excited about the, the graphs and the numbers and how the boat moves and all those sorts of things. My safety mechanism under pressure, under stress, which we're, we're all under, is to retreat into that corner. So when I was lining up in Beijing, I sat on the start line thinking, yeah, everybody else knows what this is my first Olympics. What we can do. I am going to think about the physics of this boat. I'm going to move this boat in the way that I know how, and that will determine the boat speed, and the boat speed will determine the outcome of the race. That's my, that's my safety position. And through that race, um, we were kind of in the pack, we were kind of in the pack, and we realized there was kind of three of us left in it. The other two were a bit ahead. And then, literally with about 20 strokes to go, I realized that, wasn't out of the question that we could win it. And once I believed that the win was possible, we took a boat length and then a boat length and a half and then nearly, nearly two boat lengths out of the, the leading, leading two crews. Unfortunately, they were six inches further than that ahead of us. So you, you watch the race and we do this massive charge and then we still come third. And um, I, yeah, it's good things like this. Um, but then when I had a chance to review that, I thought the one thing that could have made the difference was if I'd believed on the start line that that was, that was there. And, and we didn't have the data to show that. And I was so reliant on the data at that point. And I guess that's what made me appreciate and understand that you need not just data, but you need humans. And you need human insight, human interaction. You can't just have one. But when you put the two together, when you actually unite those two and appreciate them both and, and take both of those inputs and put them in the same team and in the same boat, then you, then you leap ahead. And when Catherine and I were together, you know, we were unbeatable, but we needed each other. We couldn't just, just take the one approach. And I think that's where the special impact of data is. Okay. So there's a hybrid that we need to have, where we need to have both the data as well as the humanity and bring it together to do something special. We have been in a universe in which we've only used the hum humanity and only used the gut instinct and the feeling and the, the sentiment of things. And now we can apply data in this new tool. So let's look at, at how we would use data in a novel way. I could imagine in car making, you've been using data for years, but there's something new going on. What's Aston Martin doing? What aren't we doing at the minute? I mean, I'm right. um, <laughs> currently working with uh, Adrian Newey and developing a new ultra car. So we're... Uh, Data is important within the car industry, of course it is, but intuition is also important. And, you know, we, ha we have pride in beauty, so we create beautiful cars. So the data can tell us be we need a certain car in a certain segment because there's a certain customer. The data can't tell us what beautiful is. We can measure beauty because science are very similar in terms of measuring what beautiful is. But our in particular interpretation of beauty, therefore, the success of that product is something that we need intuition for. So we do use data, and we collect data, um, but sometimes data can't predict a future in terms of what will be, what will be someone's passion in 2021. What is passion in 2021 for someone? Because today we could probably measure it. We look at what people buy and we can ask them, but we don't know what they'll find attractive in 2021. The groups that do well at Aston Martin, who are working together versus the ones who don't produce so well, uh, come in a little bit over budget, a little over deadline, the project just sort of falls flat. Have you found any commonalities about the teams and why they work well versus those that don't work as well? Well, I think if, if you look at Aston Martin, we're an independent company. We can't go over budget. Uh, one of the things of independence is we have to succeed project by project. So the whole point of communication is, is knowing early enough if someone's in crisis mode. And if you know early enough, we can all work together to fix it. If we don't talk and people hide their data, they hide their outcome, then we, then we end up crashing. So the most important thing is, not literally crashing, <laughs> the most important thing is to find out where, where the teams are at and know honestly through communication 
where your data is at. Are you on track? Are you on time? Are you on budget? Can you deliver so the next team can take the baton and deliver their part of it? If anyone hides their data, then we end up in a situation of crisis. Andrew's nodding. So yeah, I don't think you can't hide from data. I think I think you've got to drive everything off it. I think it's 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 a truth. Now, many interpretations of the truth, but obviously in Formula One, you you rig cars up with huge amounts of uh, sensors to measure data to get everything from how's the driver doing through to how is your aerodynamic performance. I think manufacturing businesses have used data for years. You know, this the idea of the Pareto analysis where you say, right, I go through my whole organisation, I work out where I'm losing time. So I think that there's, there's, there's an element in data where if you're trying to bring about change in organisation or improve this idea of continuous improvement, you have to drive it off data. Because if you, if you produce data and it's, and it's believed to be credible and it's authentic, then people can't argue with it. And then that drives a conversation. So in our organisation, one of the things I've been looking at is um, you know, getting people actually very simply to log the, data, the issues that they have in the business. So what are things that are slowing you down, affecting your day-to-day -day job, how you can make it more efficient. And from that data, then you say, actually, you go and see a colleague, you say, did you know that your actions somewhere upstream is impacting someone downstream? And they go, I didn't know that. Show me the data. And you go, OK, look, here's all the data, and it's costing us time, and therefore efficiency. So data, I think, is a very, very neutral way to drive, um, and properly done. It must be done with care, authenticity, and a trusted source. It's a very good way to drive, drive a conversation and to, to therefore drive teamwork. It's also an equaliser. It, it takes out emotion mm -hmm. because exactly. you, can't, you can't argue with the data yeah. because whenever, there, therefore the emotion is gone. I'm sorry. <clears throat> whenever I hear someone say you can't argue with the data, I want to reach for my revolver. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it takes a certain quality in a manager to appreciate that you shouldn't argue with the data uh, or you can in certain domains but not in other ways. In lots of, you know, in lots of instances, you present data to a manager and it just doesn't matter. It's really all about what they want to do. It's all about the bureaucratic realities. It's all about power. It's all about, we've already decided this. It's all about, you know, my wife's on the board. Um, <laughs> tell me about the horror stories, Andrew, that you've endured, well, think, in yeah. which you've presented uh, data uh, yeah. in the most well-meaning way, where I, I can tell you about one of my stories, <laughs> internally in my companies, where I had a slam dunk. And you know what? It didn't matter. I burnt my fingers well, by I, I, presenting I, data to the wrong The question person. I would raise is, did you do data on the companies you're going to work for? Because, you know, the good quality companies, my experience, I, I've hard to my experience, the companies I've worked for, the, generally, if you prevented so fair data to a range of people, then, you know, fair-minded people will make this, come to the same conclusions about data. I think you've got to be very careful about taking data out of context and how you farm your data and use it. But generally, what you do, you start by saying, we think there's a, there's a, a feeling there's a problem out there. Uh, everyone says, oh, I've heard this, I've seen this, it's all the scuttlebutt. What I've always aimed to do is turn that into hard fact. So I'd say, right, sh you get a consensus on what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it, and then you get people who are trusted to go it, get it, and then they bring it back. So I've not, I've not, I'm interested to hear your stories too, but I've not had a calamity where I've gone and said, here's all the data. I've had, we can't, or we agree with you, there's a change need to maybe we can't afford to do it, or can we find a different way, etc. But it's rare when data which is, you know, well-intended, well-meant, and well-collected has been rejected, in my experience. I think it, I would argue, I would say, I, 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 would, I would agree that it requires a new form of literacy, that the people have to be open to mm. thinking about problems in new ways with data. Dan, how about your experience? It, it, I think it depends on um, uh, how clear your strategic aims are. So if you don't have a clear strategic aim, you won't get commitment from your workforce, if you don't have commitment, you can't hold people accountable, you won't, you won't deliver. So when you're talking about, um, uh, about data, it, it also it sits within that context, but it's also um, where do you stand in that organization? So if you're in a, a relatively small team that's got a very clear, clearly defined task for you to, to deliver, it's very or it's much easier to get good data that will help you achieve your aim. The wider you get into that, and, and obviously my background in, in defense, um, you know, working in uh, 30 plus billion pound programs drives you to something that's so broad and complex and, ha and sits in such a strategic con uh, context, a political context, it makes uh, picking the wheat from the chaff with all of that data that's out there really, really difficult because it's not, it's not one high performing team 
or low performing team, but it's a whole raft of teams that sit within there. So you have to, as you get in, in, into that aspect, it's more into broader data about how those teams are interacting rather than the specifics of how fast something goes, how good it is at logistics, how, uh, uh, what the cost is likely to be through life, those sorts of things. What would you prefer to do? Would you rather throw resources to raise the overall mean, or would you rather throw resources to take the winners and make them win even better? Uh, it depends. And I, I, it's not a cop-out in there. It, it, it absolutely depends. So that assumes from, from, from that aspect that you can afford to take winners and discard losers. So it might be that you've got a... Um, I, I guess it comes down to, as well, performance. So we talk about high-performing teams. What do we mean by performance? So if you talk about your industries, then, uh, and in fact about rowing, it's very clear what your performance is. Yours is to get from here over there as quickly as you possibly can. And you do everything that you can to do that. When you start getting into, uh, into other areas, your performance might be measured on, for, for me, it might be measured on safety, because I'm, reg I'm regulated and I'm individually and legally responsible for people's lives. Um, it might be that it's ethical or moral. So we, you know, we, we go out and we fight wars with people and we commit violence and we do that ethically within the law. So those drive very different parameters for you to look at. And some of those are non-discretionary. You can't choose them. Uh, fair. But in lots of instances and in companies, managers have to make decisions whether what they're going to do, if they're going to try to improve the overall quality yeah. or if they're going to just try to get those who are great to be even better. Uh, and that's, those are hard decisions. Uh, you're creating winners and losers. Uh, you're ex extenuating inequalities within the organization, whether it's through uh, promotions and through, um, through salaries uh, or, or through just a sense of satisfaction in work. Have, either, have any of you guys had to make these sorts of decisions in business in which you had to sort of choose one or the other? And I'll even take a step further, which is uh, the effect on the overall economy in terms of corporate performance could be huge. If we, if we are really going to apply this new science and art to uh, what makes teams work really well versus just good, and, we were, and it scales up through society and through companies, we're going to see um, a widening of performance overall, system-wide, and you'll have the gods of the Fortune 500, maybe we'll talk about the Fortune 25, and we'll have everyone else, right, who, who didn't make those investments, who didn't learn from data, who therefore can't hire the best data scientists, who therefore can't hire the best employees to work together, and we're going to have an economy that looks kind of polarized. For me, that's exactly the kind of interesting question, with my, with my mathematician's hat on for a second, that data science can attack. Because, you know, you, you do have a conflict. You, you can see you've got a set of teams. So, you know, it's the same in sport. Do you just focus all your resources on the best athletes in the squad, or do you bring on the, uh, the other ones? How do, you, how do you possibly optimize that system? Well, if you've got a big system, you think it's harder, it's actually easier because you've got a huge amount of data. And if you've got data, you can build a model. And if you can build a model, you can optimize the model. And that's when you can actually get answers to things that you couldn't get answers to before. So I think that is what you've put your finger on there is a new frontier, in my opinion. Well, I will also say there's a sort of a sample bias here. As an Olympic gold medalist, you are in the environment of having the zone flooded so that you could actually optimize your performance. You're the best, at the time, the best in the world at what you did. So the answer in that instance would be we were trying to get peak performance, not increase overall. But if we had a policy decision about, say, public education, this is where it really matters. Do we want more kids at Oxbridge or do we want to get everyone at, at, uh, at, public, at state schools just to perform 2% better and have the win over the overall entire economy rather than people who can afford houses in Mayfair? <sighs> I think, I think, the, it's, it, I think there's, there's, there's two things about data. One is when have you got enough to make a decision? Because, um, you know, very often in life, if you make a decision late, you might, it's still the wrong decision. So it's a lot about timing. Um, they always say in Formula 1 that you should pit, pit, pit uh, a lap before you thought that you should. 
So that this idea of this hindsight, you want to pit, you want to pit behind or in time to overtake your competition. So I think there's, the problem with data is it can lead to paralysis. And I think that's where your point earlier about, if you've got as an organisation a very clear objective about what you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. it does make life easier. And I think, you know, in, in professional sport, the easy is you're just out to win. I think once you get into other, other domains and some companies, it's much, much harder to work out what is the actual winning objective. Um, I, I work in the financial services industry now. It's pretty obvious. It's about you know getting um, return on investments for our customers. It's very straightforward. It's easily measured. It's measured in the papers every day. Um, so I think for us, there's very clear parallels. I think between performance, sport, and and what we do. But I think in some in some I can imagine in your your part of the world, it's it's harder because actually it's, it is a lot more subjective. It's a lot more emotional, and you're and you're driven by a, a whole range of forces which which won't which will have other other uh, things they're thinking about other than just what's the right thing to do yeah, based on data. And you, don't, and you don't know that you've lost until somebody's dead. Yeah. So you don't get the chance to go and practice it yeah. in, in that sense. One of the things that I find really vibrant about, <clears throat> about the environment that we're in now is that in the past, sort of like the 20th century way of thinking about it, is that we had to try to optimize around a single goal, where now we can sort of feel more comfortable in... Uh, un in uncertainty and in complexity and optimize around multiple goals at the same time. And we have new tools that allow us to do that. We don't have to say it's just about profit, it's about profit and not getting sued, right? It's not just about winning the war, it's about winning the war with the least number of casualties, right? I'm interested in also in the idea of the control mechanism. I'm sure there's been instances in which you had the data, you could learn something from it, but you couldn't actually change anything. You couldn't actually implement it. There, Andrew, you're nodding again. Let me pick well, on you. Well, I think you've got to be careful what you measure, because what you measure is what you do. So if you set someone an objective and you measure against it, you'll get that, that behavior. So I think um, you have to be very careful in, in managing particularly in people that you're, you're focusing on measuring the right things. I think it's a grave danger in, um, in uh, you know, organizations often suffer from you know, saying we're going to measure either too much data and they can't make any sense of it, or they're just, just pointing in the wrong direction. And so I think it's, it's really important to, A, this is what I think having a, a single objective for an, a, a business. You know, Formula One was very easy. It was all about, you know, how do we increase car performance? And we looked at data and we said, whether we have a graduate trainee scheme, whether we put better coffee on the truck or we put a new performance part in the car, it's all about winning. It's all about car performance. And I think that's, that if you, that's a really simple, straightforward goal. You know what to measure, you know what your objective is, you measure against that, you measure everything against it. Um, so I, I, I always think, you know, for corporations, and it's, it is really hard to often distill it down, but there's a, it's clarity of purpose, and then there's a clarity of purpose that needs to speak to your employees and also to your, your clients. If you can sort those two things out and focus on that, then I think you can start to take the lessons around data and performance sport into your business. Did you, have you ever... Have you, do you have any examples of where you've actually measured data and then improved performance based on learning something that you wouldn't have thought to know before you'd actually measured it? Yeah, I mean, the example I, I drew briefly on earlier, we, we were, you know, very simple. We, I mean, in, in, in Formula One, you have fault reporting systems. So basically, after every single race, you go through every single thing that went wrong with the car, you go through everything that went wrong with everybody else's car, and you go, what can we learn? So I brought a very simple system at Schroeder's to one of the teams, and we literally, everyone wrote down what was going wrong, what didn't work in their teams. And um, what it showed, actually, was that we received data in overnight to our systems, and it showed that it wasn't arriving when we expected it to arrive. Therefore, the, the, I mean, our computer systems actually weren't running as quite as fast as they could. And so it was a very, str and so it wasn't go and invest more money in data systems or go and spend a lot of money. It was literally ring up the data suppliers, the data vendors, and go, "Do you realise that you know one out of four nights you give us our data late?" And they go, "Oh no, actually we didn't realise that, or we didn't realise that had an impact." So it comes back to your point that, again, we use data actually to drive a conversation, a change in behaviour and process, rather than to, to do anything, you know, it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't involve any additional expenditure, it just involved changing process, which was free. So I think data and understanding it can give you an awful lot of what I call free, free performance gains. Okay, let me, let me pick up on this for a second, because the, the interesting thing about a military is that it's a hierarchy and it's a bureaucracy. Um, you have to, tr you have to have your, your your interchangeable parts are human, um, and you need them to, in fact, act like machines. Although you also need them sometimes to act with discretion, but discretion that you can 
control. Um, and if you want uh, admirals in uh, 2035, you have to ver have very good midshipmen in, in, in 2015 because it's not like you're going to go recruit them from you know, the Navy of America. You're stuck with the, with the officers that, you're, that you have of your country. You see, that's a bad thing. Well, no, 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 well, no, it's true, but it's interesting that your central banker is from Canada. So the... Um, <laughs> The, the, the point is that, um, that it's a bureaucracy and that you have to take people in at one part of the funnel and you have to train them into another. So you have to mechanize uh, leadership. You have to mechanize team performance. How do you do that? How, can the data help us in a way that it couldn't in the past? For example, can we now know today that we couldn't know in the past what makes for a good leader? Uh, yes in some respects, um, but again, it depends on how you measure it. So my, I'm a big, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't, I'm a big fan of science, I'm a big fan of data. I've spent my life doing it, I've done operational tests, we've looked at all sorts of really cool new bits of stuff that we can't really talk about in here, but it's fascinating. <laughs> I, just wish you'd, I just wish you'd seen it. <laughs> anyway, the point is, that's really important for us to deliver in there. But when you're actually talking about human beings, it becomes something far more subjective. And you, uh, again, what we've focused on there is the admirals of the future. Now, contrary to what the newspapers say about the number of admirals, most people who are in the Navy aren't admirals. So the majority of the people that you've actually got to worry about are those. And that's how we select our people. Generally, it's the people who look after their people because those people generally have high-performing teams. The key bit about leadership, because we always come back to the science and then it's the leadership. The most important part of leadership, to me, is followership, because there's always somebody above you. It doesn't matter where you are, in what organization, in what company. However important you think you are, you're still part of something bigger, always. Uh, even as a CEO of a company, you got, you're going to end up with shareholders. There's always something. There's public scrutiny. Let me go even deeper then. Um, in the U.S. military, uh, they enter, they take about 250 new brigadier generals, bring them into a room for their indoctrination, and the commanding officer will look around. That's the one star that you have. Uh, and they will simply say, you know, boys, girls, um, if this room exploded right now and all of you perished, it would, we'd be fine. We'd go just to the next 250 on the list, right, and bring them up. Like, they, they just put them in their place, and they let them know, yeah, you got your star, congratulations. You still have to do a lot of work, and guess what? You're not that special. You're a cog in the machine. Nice cog. You're a general. You got your brigadier status, but you're a cog. The U.S. military is trying to mechanize leadership, uh, is trying to, because, it, because it's just so vast, so I want to get a better sense of if we've learned something new about what makes a good leader or a good team that we just didn't know in the same way that, say, in the, in the mid-1600s, before we had a theory of planetary motion, we had ideas of how the heavens work, and then we had a telescope, and then we could understand something that we couldn't know before. So as data helped us understand something about teams, to allow us to see something, to detect it that we couldn't know, and then it, or in fact, to then foster it where before it was just sort of trial and error and luck. We can use it to understand um, uh, what isn't working, but it doesn't, it's very difficult to use it in many respects to tell you how. I don't think the military is going to be a leading uh, sort of indicator for using data in, or maybe I'm wrong, in leadership. We use, I mean, I use it every week, availability of aircraft. So squadron, you know, I've got eight squadrons. That squadron doesn't produce the same availability as that squadron. It's the same squadron, same layout. But do you know anything aircraft. about the people? Sure, but do you know anything? Can you detect something about the people to say, oh, yeah, because we've got like type A personalities here and type B there, or that. No, um, you, no there's, there, there are often answers, so, and it will come down to data that's available. So, you know, what, what delivery of logistics have you got? You know, how, how are things. So, we measure, we, we measure performance broadly in a capability. And when we talk about a capability, it's, it's training. It's equipment, because we always focus on equipment, but it's only one part, so training. So how well are they all trained? So are all the people on there trained? We've got data that shows us that, because you'll always have a percentage that are in training in there. 
Um, the equipment, have they got the same equipment? However, they've got a slightly different mod state, which is actually modification state, which is driving a different logistics chain. Personnel, are they manned at 100%? Well, we've got all that data, and we use that to, to make these judgments on there. That's personnel. And you've got infrastructure. Now, well, actually, their hangar's falling down, and theirs is a pristine new hangar. Um, but wouldn't you then presume that like the pristine new hangar would work better than the one that's falling apart? Yeah, but it's not always the case. Not okay. always the case. <laughs> so, but, but what I'm saying is we use data all the time and it can help us. And it can help us understand why. Can I understand why something's not working. What you need to fix it might be money, might be uh, a change of personnel. It might be, in many respects, just hugely difficult to quantify. You know, and it's, 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 a, it's a cultural thing. And you try and drive a culture of, a questioning culture, an open culture within it, which sounds, which sounds an odd thing for a military, but we, we very much lead in that. We question. doesn't mean I tell someone to do something and they ask me why every time. <laughs> but the point is, we, we breed a questioning culture. And I, I try and demonstrate that by, by questioning my, you know, I will, I will take people with me to, to, to meetings and when we come out, I ask them, how did I do? How did I do in there? Did we get that right? Did we get all the points across? And it makes them feel that it's okay to question, that they, when they go up the tree, that they're not expected to know everything because you've got to go down and you've got to seek that from other people. Sometimes the data, do you, is there a problem that you don't have ground truth, that you have the data and people rely on the data too much? For me? Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, it, it's, it's about the question. So what, what question are you asking when you're seeking that data? Uh, and that is the art. That's why, uh, and you know, broadly speaking, I think it's all art, even the science. It's what question are you asking? I knew you'd do that. What question are you asking? Yeah, of course, I love it. Uh, and, and, and what are you trying to get from it? Because how you frame that question, and it can't just be a question and then walk away. It's got to be a question got to be a conversation that comes back from those people delivering you that analysis and then back again. And the example that I'll give you is not one from the current world because I'm still serving, so I can't use it. So I'll use a historical example. In, in, uh, in World War II, uh, the, uh, the Admiralty looked for a new fighter uh, to, to put on its carriers. And at this point, we were growing from four or five carriers and we ended up with about 50 plus carriers at the end of the war. So there's a lot of aircraft that were going on board these. And the answer came back as the best fighter uh, was uh, a late mark of Spitfire uh, that was to be converted into to be a Seafire. And that was fantastic until some bright spark realized a few things and actually asked the right questions. Because what they'd looked at is turn performance against the Japanese threat because it was out in, in that theater. And they'd looked at how it performed up and away in the air. And somebody asked the right questions, which was, where are we sending it? Oh, we're sending it to the Pacific Theatre. Does yeah. anyone have Spitfires out there? No. Why don't we buy an American aeroplane where there's lots of them, lots of spares, so logistics, you're going to have more availability, they're going to be there. Is it good enough in the air? Yep, it's definitely good enough in the air. And by the way, we won't kill so many people on landing because the Spitfire is designed to land on land, and it's got a spindly little lander carriage, and it collapses all the time, and a massive nose where you can't see the ship, and you lose a lot of people. So the point is, we ended up using data really badly by asking the wrong question. It was a valid question, what's the best fighter? But it didn't give you the answer. So it had to be tailored to be the right question. America had, had, had at the exact same time, had the exact same issue that it was facing. The war in Europe had ended, and uh, the war in uh, the Pacific was still going on. And so they needed to take the planes from the European theater to the Pacific theater. Very simple, you fly them from the continent to Britain, you fly them from the Britain to probably Canada or the US and then across the US and then you get them into the Pacific. Logical, that's what the, uh, what the US military was planning on doing. Until a bright spark came along and realized a lot of fuel, you need new parts and spares, it's gonna be problems, you're better off actually building them in California and putting them out there, just, just decommission them in Europe. The military couldn't believe it, but actually he ran the numbers and he showed it. He was a former statistics professor at Harvard, Robert Mac McNamara, the man who then would be the architect of the, uh, of the Vietnam War and relied on data, sadly, in another way there too. Um, we're approaching 
uh, the end, but we have still some more time and you've brought something up. You've laid down the gauntlet, Dan, and you've said, it's art. So let me go really quickly, art or science? Art, art or science? Science. Art or science? <laughs> Both. No, it doesn't count. Art or science? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to push back because I think I think the art is knowing the questions to ask. <laughs> let's let's, let's pick that up. I'll I'll, I'll give you an. So I'm going to make I you abstain. You know, Merrick, right. art or science? No boundary. Sorry, art is science. Science is art. Oh <laughs> my God! <laughs> Boo. Okay, everyone, Sorry. we're going to do a poll. So, art or science? First, art. Raise your hand. Okay, that looks like it's maybe about 15.6 of you. Okay, science. Raise your hand. Okay, that looks like it's about 80%. Is that right, 80-20? So, uh, but Da Vinci, artist yeah. or scientist. Okay, and hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait. And, and who, who hasn't voted because they're really sort of hopeless, like Andrew? Raise your hand. <laughs> you. There's a couple, about 5% we've got. Good. Okay. Um, of course, there's this golden mean approach in which we can all sing Kumbaya and blend these things. And you look like you want to say something. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I was um, interested in... You were talking a lot about framing the right question and what um, you know, this, this human part that needs to be there at the beginning of using the data to make sure that the data is, is serving you and not the other way around. And I thought it was interesting as well um, what you were saying, Mark and Andrew, about data is useful for abstracting the issue and, and maybe cutting through some of the communication issues of where you maybe need what we used to call in rowing a robust discussion. Um, you, you take it slightly, slightly outside. And I thought maybe there was something interesting to say about the other end of that, of that data process. You're starting to, you're starting to get some outputs from, from all of the data, from all of the things you understand, whether you understand them even through intuition or whether they're coming out of the numbers. And in, in my world of rowing, you know, we'd have a huge amount of experience about what would make the boat go fast. We'd sit, you know, six hours a day, one behind the other, and um, test out these things and try and find the bit of speed. And we would um, talk a lot in the boat. I was quite lucky because Catherine, I couldn't hear a word she says because she sits at sits so in front of me, so um, the communication between the two of us was often at the set of her shoulders, and you, know, you, you sit behind <laughs> someone for three years, you kind of know what they're thinking. <laughs> so we had this, this, this slightly funny communication, but because we spent all that time together, we could be in a race, and we could be in the middle of a race, and um, you know, my job in, in the bow seat was to read the, uh, the other crews and what they were doing and absorb... Uh, that and make sort of tactical decisions, also to make technical calls about what was, we read how I was wearing, how Catherine was wearing, how that affected the boat between us, um, what did we need to do to, to uh, optimise our efficiency and also to sort of make our race calls that we'd already planned out. So all of those things I need to get into something. Um, often the only thing that you can do is do a syllable because you're, you know, you're at heart rate 180. So all I can say to Catherine is time. Now, we have to make sure that she knows exactly what that means. And in our Olympic final, what it meant was we're going to just have um, a couple of milliseconds more patience here because our blades will extract a little more easily. And then that will mean that we won't arrive at the front of the stroke ahead of the boat and we'll naturally be able to pick up, pick up the boat. Um, we call on the rise just as we're, we arrive at the front at the same time as the oil's going in the water. We, um, we get our blades buried in the water within a few uh, frames on the video, which is always our measurement. And, and I could say that just in the one word because we we'd distilled our information. And I, um, I just wondered how that works in your world because you think of data, you think of a massive Excel, shed, Excel spreadsheet, the worst thing in the world, right? Um, how do you pull out what's important. And I wondered how you, how you do that in, in your worlds. Well, how that, you know, in sport, you kind of know what you've got to do. You've got to find a syllable. What do you well, have to find? A small, that's the space that's for the human, isn't it? If you think yeah. if we were discussing Adrian Newey before he came on board, sort of probably the world's greatest ever living racing driver. And I, 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 when I joined Shredders, I interviewed 188 people. And I went around all our fund managers and I tried to work out what their method, what, what was their data. And, you know, a lot of them are, you know, they're, they're just like the aerodynamicists at McLaren. They're just creative geniuses. And, and that's how I can describe them. Because I went and I just couldn't work their method. And I, 
what I realized was from that was humans are very, very good at handling data. And some of these, 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 these folks, they've spent years thinking about markets, market performance, might understand Asian markets really, really well. And what they think is intuition, I think, is actually they've amassed years and years and years and years and years of experience. And I think you can't beat experience for how to look at data, interpret it, and make decisions. So I think we're still in that, that wonderful era where we've got a lot of data about, but actually the human, and, and, some, you know, and, the, the, and the, they're relatively rare, but there's some very, very special humans out there who can make really what they think is an intuitive decision, but actually they're probably processing data in a way that we don't yet quite understand. Yeah. I agree. Or your, or, or your decision maker isn't like that, and that's often the case, and therefore the, the, the art in it is turning something that's hugely, hugely complex into something simple. So anyone can write a 10,000 word essay, but writing something in a paragraph that conveys all of that simply, or in a picture, or in a color, or something, and, and that's, you know, if, if, you imagine, if you imagine this space here is, is all the time that the Prime Minister deals with different departments, then my department's that little you know, brass bit in the middle, and my bit of that department is a tiny little slither. So when push comes to shove, and she sees that bit of information, it can't be very long, because she's rather busy with the rest of this floor. <laughs> um, so you really have to, that's where you have to have that communication with the people providing you with the data to, to really work out the clarity of the product. So the product is really, really important. The information is important, but actually it's the product, because otherwise you have the best data in the world and nobody cares. You know, I find it very ironic that uh, we're here and you're all making this great claim, this great embrace of, of the human in this world of big data. Uh, and I think it's because you're sort of maybe ahead of others in this, and so you recognize that it just can't be a world of ice-cold algorithms that you need to actually have the humanity and the spark of of ingenuity and ambition and risk-taking and thirst of the, of, of, of the soul in what we actually do. But the, but the irony there is that we've been doing this and relying on human judgment for, for years without realizing that it's bound by human judgment, who, which can be fallible, which can be short-sighted. Uh, smart people eventually become very, very smart and then they pass away and a new generation has to take over. And what's sort of interesting is that in the machine learning community, there's a term for it. It says you're stuck in a local optima, right? A local optima is the idea is that you have optimized, but it's sort of like if you were climbing hills and you want to get the highest summit in, in the Himalayas, you got to one summit, but you don't really know if you could be higher and you'd have to climb down and do it, and there's a change cost to do it, to get to yet another summit that's even, indeed even higher. But the machines can do that, right? And in fact, the whole point of applying data to our problems is that there's just simply some problems that are too complex that no one human would come up with the optimal answer to. And in fact, a machine can do it because they're better at collecting a lot more data and analyzing it. So it's just sort of interesting that in the, the, we're stepping into this new world in which we can have machines make decisions and spot patterns that human beings can't do, yet you're really embracing the human. Well, there's a... I mean, there's an ethical argument as well. If you, mm. if you look at my world, I won't exist in a... Well, I won't exist in a few years anyway, will I? <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, uh, uh, pilots, uh, you know, will, will go unmanned. But ha in fact, show of hands, how many people in here want to go on their holidays in an aeroplane without a pilot in it? Yeah, I would. And, and I is one. Uh, uh, you know, people make mistakes in that sense. Uh, and... Uh, there's a reason why airlines uh, don't allow their pilots generally to train live with passengers in the back. They let the machines do it. They save that for the simulator, or if it goes wrong. That's not to say, you know, then they're, they're not needed. Of course they are now, but actually the technology is there where you don't need it. But intuitively, we don't want to do it. In terms of unmanned air systems, um, we call them drones which has a very different connotation. Well, we don't, actually, in the military. We, we call them remotely piloted vehicles. Um, and the reason for that is drone has a connotation which is a, an autonomous, non-thinking um, drone that will go off and do what it wants, which is not the case with an unmanned system. But there are ethical arguments that you'll, or discussions that you'll end up going into 
in the advance of science, where data will tell you that's a far better way to deliver air power. But how do we feel as a nation about not putting anyone in harm's way and just delivering it over there? It all sounds great, but it comes back to bite you. So it's, uh, it, it becomes a very difficult line to tread. We have a little bit more time for questions. So why don't we see a, ray, a show of hands of those people who have a question. I'll try to maybe bundle them together. I see one person for the moment, so please ask your question, and we'll ask for others as well. Um, I was just wondering about when you're, you're doing an organization and doing leaders, if you're looking at how they react under pressure. I mean, obviously, in, in Formula One, a driver might be great on the track when there's no one there, but in a race with 30 people, it's entirely different. And obviously, in a, in a rowing race, um, you know, people may perform really well on an ergo machine, but when they're in a race, they don't kind of have the same drive. It's usually the other way around. Well, whatever. <laughs> if you've been on a rowing machine, you don't... Just, yeah. But Understand. when it gets to the Navy, I mean, you could have a fantastically disciplined group of, of, of leaders, and um, but once the bombs start falling, they, they, they might go to pieces, and unfortunately, you won't find that out until after the fact. Um, where with the Formula One and, and the Olympics, you know, don't want to, you know, it won't really matter, you know, if someone falls apart. But in in, in the Navy, it, it's a massive thing. How do you how do you cope with that? Uh, well, you you continually put people under pressure, so pressure comes in 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 many different forms. Um, you know, the, the pressure to uh, the pressure to come in under budget drives people. Uh, you know, it, dri it drives behaviours in people, and some people panic when they get close to a deadline uh, to produce some work. Uh, we fly, sail, um, operate in in as realistic an environment as we can. Some of that's simulated, some of that's real, and we we push ourselves to to the limit and put people under uh, under pressures where they th you know they think it's real. If I go and fly a simulator sortie and uh, I've got an emergency and I'm dealing with it, I don't, I, these days the simulators are so good, I don't think I'm sat in a box, you know, four feet off the ground. I think I'm at 30,000 feet and if I don't get this right, I'm going to be on the end of a parachute. So that drives you to, that drives, press, that, drives that pressure where you can assess it in a, in a non-threatening environment. I think in, in sport you have a great opportunity to learn how to deal with pressure and it's been one of the greatest surprises, pleasant surprises that I had in my own career is that it's something that you can learn. Um, I used to be a, a white terror type of person. I actually tried to learn to fly planes once and I was, I was terrible because I was okay until I did my... Um, check flight for going solo and then as soon as somebody was assessing me, you know, I messed up the landing every time and I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to be a pressure person. How am I going to, you know, and, and then it would happen with exams and things like that at school and um, I, you know, there are techniques and this is, this is a great revelation to me, you know, <laughs> breathing techniques, putting yourself through it lots and lots of times until it, until your, um, your adrenaline response kind of fades a little bit gets used to it and um, your fear of pain diminishes an awful lot if you put yourself in a lot of pain all of the time. <laughs> so, um, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, I think that can be trained. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Please. Oh, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. Yeah, the question is about selecting data. I used to work in the health service and um, the statisticians used mortality as a measure because it's easy to measure. You're dead or you're not. It's a binary. Um, yep. Whereas, is someone ill? Are they not ill? And so the data that was collected was actually very good data but in terms of its use in making leadership decisions, um, it was limited. And I wonder whether you've got anything to say about how you actually choose the data on which you, um, you base your process. You know, I, 
I have, I have so much to say about that. The world is so, and, and authority is so manipulative. Uh, and um, by that I mean the, uh, the biggest hoax in, in stats is, is mortality for just the purpose that you said. Statisticians love it because you just, it's, it's so easy to count. And I remember I was in Japan as the Tokyo correspondent for The Economist during the Fukushima crisis. And the really interesting thing is that we don't have, a, the world doesn't have a lot of, well, the world has a lot of information about uh, how the human body you know, exists under conditions of nuclear poisoning, of radiation, provided it's an explosion with a single blast, with a lot of radiation in a short period of time. And we're in effect blind to understanding how the human body reacts to radiation in low doses over a long period of time. But we have some data that we can look at, and that is um, Chernobyl, right? So all the stats were based on Chernobyl, and the unit of measure is mortality, not quality of life, not illness. So the Japanese government was making decisions about what to do about people based on complete ridiculous data that served its interests because it's really expensive and because there's a lot of public fear. And when you find out that not that many people died from Chernobyl, it looks like the world is a safe place. You can have a nuclear accident and you can sort of manage it in a very, in a, in a, in a calm environment, in a calm way. But if you actually looked at the right thing, you know, people who have had poisoning and their children have, are grotesquely deformed, you would actually come to a different conclusion. You'd say, well, actually, maybe we should be doing different things at a different pace. From my perspective, I think it's, that's such a critical issue. I mean, that's why I bring up the issue of ground truth, that although we need to embrace data in the world of big data, we need to rep recognize that the data is limited, that it's only a representation of reality and it's not the real thing, like a map is not territory. I think there's a, there's, there's a big ethical dimension to data, isn't there? And the fact is that um, it can be used, you know, statistics and there's lies and then the old allergies that go with it. I think the point is that I think in terms of our national authorities that stand there and measure data, I think the, the ethics and the, the incumbent on anyone who's handling large amounts of data is, is, really, is really, really important because, you know, um, every week some report comes out, tells us to eat something different or do something better or whatever. Um, I sort of, I sort of hope that basically by the fact that there's so much that, and there's so many people interested in looking at data, that anyone who comes out with something which is obviously, obviously far way off will be quickly challenged. I think that's why data, uh, if it's a, if it's a vehicle for communication, is a really, really good thing. Uh, I think data, you know, manipulated using wrong hands or not properly grounded in, in rigor, is, is a bad thing. And I think it's, it's, it's always really important to sort of keep questioning, but you know, you've got that result in the data, but why is that and why is that and why that? This idea of the five whys and just keep questioning until you get to the reason that data is real. So I think, as, as you were saying, there's a huge ethical dimension. And I'm not sure actually as a society we've actually really dealt with that yet. We sort of get a lot published in the press and we believe a lot, but actually getting to ground truth I think is one of the big challenges of our, of our generation.